thank you guys for being here on Memorial Day weekend. I really appreciate it. It's encouraging to me to stand up when I teach a class and, and see a whole lot of people out there. So thank you for that. You know, I love gardening. I've always liked gardening. Uh, that is not a picture of me. That's Dale Hearn as a kid. But I have always, always liked it. I think maybe it's because it's... it's getting to play in the dirt as an adult, and there's just something fun about that. I, I think it may also be because I work in a job where you'll work for five or ten years before you see results. And when you go out in a garden and work, you see results both immediately and in a longer picture. So if you want to go out and, and till the ground or, or pull weeds when you're through, it looks different than it did when you started. You, you, you can go out and pick vegetables and you can look at them and you can eat the ones that are good and give the others to Becky. You can, uh, you, you can, you, it's, there's just something very satisfying about it. But as I was thinking through it, another reason I really like gardening is it appeals to the math nerd in me. I love the math of gardening. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Ten kernels of corn. Those are ten corn seeds. You plant ten corn seeds in a group, and you're going to get ten corn stalks that, depending upon variety, are going to have one to two ears per stalk. But let's just say one. So ten little seeds will make ten ears of corn. Now, I'm sure you knew this, but if not, I'll throw it out there. The average ear of corn has 800 seeds, 800 kernels. So, 10, and I'm joking about you having known that because I didn't know it. I had to look it up on the internet. Um, 10 ears of corn is going to make 8,000 more seeds. Now, all of a sudden, You've got enough seeds not only for your little garden, but you've got enough seeds to give to all of your neighbors. Because all the neighborhood gardens, unless we're like commercial growers, are going to feast on those 8,000 seeds. It's really cool how the math works. Now the reason I bring that up today is because the same thing happens in a sense to the people of Israel. The people of Israel started out as a family. It's the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the family of, of, uh, of uh, those offspring that go down into Egypt. While they are in Egypt, that family becomes a nation that God calls out. There's a passage on this out of Deuteronomy 26 that says, A wandering Aramean was my father... And he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt, gave us the promised land. We were an established nation. So the people of Israel start out as a family. And they become a nation. But as we've walked through our Old Testament study, we've seen the nation get destroyed. We've seen the ten tribes conquered by Assyria. And we've seen now Judah, the remaining tribes, conquered by Babylon. And the people of Israel have fled to Egypt. They've fled north to Assyria. They've fled to Judah uh, or, or exiled to Judah. They've, they've moved throughout. And the family that became a nation is no longer a nation. Israel will not become a nation again until 1947 A.D. So the family that became a nation has now become a people. And when I say a people, there are people who are dispersed throughout the world. We know that there are some in Judah. We know that there are some in Egypt. We know there are some in Babylon. We know that there are some in Susa just from the things we've been studying. This is what scholars call the diaspora from two Greek words. Those same two Greek words that make up that fancy diaspora also make up a very ordinary English word, disperse. It's the same two Greek words. 
It's just the common word. So if you come across diaspora and you think, I wonder what that means, just remember, oh, that's just fancy theological talk for dispersed. The diaspora are the Jews that are living dispersed throughout the world. So that's what you've got. Now we get to Nehemiah at a time of the diaspora where the Jews are living around the world. We do know of them in the locations I've thrown up on the map. But the issue then becomes what makes a Jew a Jew? If it's no longer the immediate, I can go back to Father Abraham. If it's no longer the, uh, uh, I live in the nation of Judah. What makes a Jew a Jew? What makes an Israelite an Israelite? By the way, the Israelites are called Israelites and not Jews before the Babylonian exile. It's that exile return where they're called Jews from Judah. But what makes a Jew a Jew? Why can't they just be people who live everywhere with everybody else? How are they Jews when they're not in Judah? Why are they Jews when they're back in Judah? What makes a Jew a Jew? Why is a Jew special? If you're living in the time of Nehemiah, you're just living under the Persian Empire. You're paying your taxes to the Persian king. You only have the rights afforded you by the Persian government. Are you a, 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 a special? You live all over the world. What makes a Jew special? And how should a Jew live? Now, we're looking at this from 2012. What I urge you to do is look at it from 500 B.C. or 450 B.C. You know, we're sitting there saying, well, a Jew is special because ultimately they were descended from Abraham. God called them, and they live by the law that God gave them. But back then, most of them didn't even have the law. Most of them aren't reading and writing. Most of them probably can register their lineage, but a lot of them can't all the way through. And, and the law talks about sacrifices. That works fine if you're in Jerusalem, but who's going to slay a goat if you're living in Susa, Persia? So these are the issues. These are the questions that are are probing the minds of Nehemiah and others during this time period. So it's a time period of the Persian Empire, and Persia has extended itself out. I want to put it into a time perspective for us to understand the story of Nehemiah. In 538 B.C., some Jews returned from the Babylonian exile. This is the year after Cyrus, the Persian king, had conquered Babylon. So Cyrus declared, you can go back, 538 B.C., some of the Jews return. By 516, they've rebuilt the temple, called the Second Temple. Now, we can put some of this into a little bit more perspective by remembering that in 492 B.C., the Persian Empire and the Greeks start their wars. Those wars are going to last for decades. You saw the, maybe <laughs> not... <laughs> You, wait, I can say this right. You saw the advertisements for the movie 300. Uh, that's the Spartan uh, guys that got wiped out by the Persians. That happened in 490 B.C. That's part of this war. 480-ish, you put a C in front of it for the Latin around, Kirka. So around 480 B.C. is the Esther story. Still war going on between Persia and Greece. Now, 469 B.C. is the birth of Socrates. So this helps us put Socrates taught Plato, taught Aristotle. This starts the chain of Greek philosophers that most of us might know, at least their names of. There have been Greek philosophers before this, but this is Socrates, okay? Now, 486 was where we left off last week. That's when Ezra returned. And Ezra read the law. 
And the people tried to address some of that stuff, though evidently not all that well. Now we get to 445 B.C., and in 445 B.C., when Socrates is 24 years old, the Nehemiah story unfolds that we're going to look at today. Our goal in the next 36 minutes is to make it through all chapters of Nehemiah. So fasten your seatbelt, buckle yourselves in, put up your tray tables because we're going to take off and really move through this story. 445 B.C., the story wrapped around Nehemiah. The story begins in Susa. That's the Persian capital for the summer home of the king. It's right on the top of the Persian Gulf, modern Iran. And, and it features Nehemiah, who we're going to know is the builder of the walls. So we'll throw Nehemiah up there. But Nehemiah, who becomes the builder of the walls, starts out as the king's wine servant. That means he's the cupbearer. That's a very important role to the king. He makes sure the king does not get poisoned. The king trusts him with his food and his life. Easiest way to kill a king, poison the king. The king must have a cupbearer or a steward who is going to watch out for the food from beginning to end and make sure it's been tested before the king eats it. So that's what Nehemiah does. And Nehemiah receives in Susa some visitors. His brother and friends have come in from Jerusalem. Nehemiah says to them, what's going on in Jerusalem? Their reply is, we have a lot of problems. There's animosity. The people of Jerusalem are at risk. And the walls are not, were never rebuilt. So there is absolutely no safety for anybody who's living or working inside Jerusalem. It is an unsafe city open to vagabonds and, 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 and people, uh, uh, robbers and, and all sorts of people in a small sense, but also in a larger sense. It's open to marauding tribes or it's open to our eternal enemies, the Samaritans, the Ammonites, people like that. Well, Nehemiah gets this news and, and he reacts in Nehemiah fashion. Now, I've put this up here because I want you to see a pattern here. The bad news comes. Nehemiah reacts with prayer. And then after he prays, he goes into action. And we'll see this over and over again in this story. Bad news, prayer, action. Let's go over to the Elmo for a moment and let's look at it first. Nehemiah chapter 1 gives us the start of this. So if we start at Nehemiah chapter 1, looking at verse 3. This is his brother and the friends. They said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the exile, they're in great trouble, they're in shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. The gates are destroyed by fire. Bad news. Prayer. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down. I wept and mourned for days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. What was the prayer? Well, it goes on and on, but you get a flavor of it at the start. O oh, Yahweh, God of heaven, great and awesome God who keeps covenant, steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I pray before you day and night for the people of Israel's your servants. Please hear our prayer. And as he goes through and he prays, he goes all the way down, the prayer goes all the way down to grant him mercy in the sight of this man. You know, O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant. Grant him mercy. Then we get the next line immediately afterwards. Now, I was cupbearer to the king. He's swinging into action. 
He's taking the resources and the tools that God has given him. And first, setting everything before the Lord in prayer, but then going to work. Going to work. And we see how he does it in chapter 2. It was the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. By the way, that's how we dated it, 445 B.C. Artaxerxes started reigning when Darius uh, died um, uh, in 465 uh, or no, Xerxes the first died, excuse me. When wine was before him, I took up the wine and I gave it to the king. Now, I had not in the past been sad in his presence. I had not been, that's past. In the past, I always, I'm Johnny Chipper when I see the king. But not this day. The implication there is this day, I decided I would be um, sullen, yeah, whoever that is. Johnny Chipper would have sullen Smitty. Um, so instead of being Johnny Chipper, he's sullen Smitty, and the king says to him, Why is your face sad? You're not sick. There's nothing but sadness of the heart. Why are you so sad? Now, I was kind of afraid. I mean, the king's supposed to dictate the mood, okay? I said to the king, let the king live forever. But why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's grave, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? So he gets the bad news, he prays about it, and then he goes to action. He decides he's going to tell the king. It's wonderful. You get the story, though. The story keeps going. Same three things. And then something else happens that's important or significant. And it could be bad news. He prays about it, and then he's in action. Watch what happens next. So the king said to me, okay, what do you want? And they write it a little differently because it's supposed to read formally as the Bible. But that in Hebrew is just, hey, what do you want? What do you want? What's he do? I prayed to the God of heaven, and then I said to the king. Now, when the king asks you something, you don't say, time out. <clears throat> okay, king, here it is. I mean, the king says, what do you want? That prayer was just, Lord, help me. And he acts. Okay? And his action is, if it pleases the king and if your servants found favor in your sight, I want you to send me to Judah. I want you to send me to the city of my father's graves that I can rebuild it. So the king gets into the details. Okay, how long are you going to be gone and what's it going to cost me? That's, I'm not making this up. That's what the text says. Okay? He says, how long are you going to be gone? And he says, well, this is how long it's going to be gone, and here's what it's going to cost you. I need uh, you to let people know about it. I need you to give me forest uh, access to build the gates, you know, because I don't have the lumber. And, and it'd be nice to have some of your army travel with me till I get there safely. So that's it. So the Nehemiah story happens. And Nehemiah the builder goes to Judah. And when he arrives in Judah, he finds some problems. Namely, the ruler of Samaria, which was, was northern Israel before the crumbling of it. But Samaria is the area north of Judah. The rulers of northern Judah, especially a governor named Sanballat, and another official, he's called a servant, but he's not a servant in the sense of a servant to Sanballat. He's a, an official in this. The servant just means a government official. So the, the Sanballat, who's the governor, and another official named Tobiah uh, get very upset over the idea that someone's going to come back and build the walls of Jerusalem or do something with Jerusalem and rebuild the city. So we need characters for them. Bob the Builder doesn't really have any enemies, so I just did the best I could. So, 
I don't know what they looked like. Uh, we're going with that. So when, when Nehemiah the builder shows up, Sanballat and Tobias, they come to him and they start jeering him. And they start mocking him. Oh, you're going to build. Oh, aren't you fancy? Showing the displeasure. So what happens? Well, they start building. And when the, the governor of Samaria, who's just a little outside his jurisdiction down in Jerusalem, when the governor of Samaria realizes that the jeering and the mockery is not working, he goes the next step, and it's one of provocation. He brings his Sumerian army down, and the army arrays, and then he starts with the, the, the verbal abuse and the challenging. I'm sure they were just looking for someone to pick up a little boulder and chunk it at one of the soldiers which would have been all the excuse needed for a melee and a massacre. So what happens? Bad news, prayer, and action. Let's look at it. The, uh, the story happens in chapter 2, verse 10. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite's servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone came to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So now we skip to verse 19. Verse 19. So Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite's servant and Geshem the Arab, they hear of it and they jeered at us, they despised us. What's this thing you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Chapter 4, the building has commenced. Now when Sanballat heard we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. He jeered at the Jews. He said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, which he's brought on location now. What are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it up in a day? Are they going to revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and the burned ones at that? And then the mini-me, uh, Tobiah the Ammonite, he's beside him and he just jumps up and says, Oh yes, oh, oh, look what they're building. If a fox steps on it, it's going to fall down. I'm sure that was very effective. Um, what's the response? Hear, O oh our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they're captives. Don't cover their guilt. Don't let their sin be blotted out. They've provoked you in the presence of Bob the Builders. And so, action. We built the wall. And all the wall was joined together to half its height because the people had a mind to work. There's a problem, there's bad news, there's prayer, and there's action. You see it over and over again. If we go back, the provocation didn't work. So at that point, the decision of, of uh, Sanballat and crew is just to fight. They're just going to send the army in and just wipe them out. They can probably do it in a night when people aren't ready or while they're all lifting really hard rocks. Just charge and go up the hill and just take them out before the wall's built. And we see this in chapter 4 as the story continues here on the Elmo. Chapter 4, verse 7. When Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the wall was going forward and the breaches were beginning to be closed, in other words, the holes between one wall segment and another are starting to be filled in, then they were very angry, and they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem to cause confusion in it. All right, bad news. What do we see? Prayer and action. And we prayed to our God, and then we set a guard as protection against them day and night. Bad news, prayer, and action. And so um, in Judah, it was said... The strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. 
by ourselves, we won't be able to rebuild the wall. Our enemies will say, they will not know or see till we come on them and kill them and stop the work. And then there are other Jews who come from uh, all directions. They said to us ten times, and remember the number ten just means over and over and over and over. Doesn't mean it was exactly ten. It just means they just, they just kept coming to us. They just came over and over and over. Think of it like we use the word kajillions. They came to us kajillions of times saying, you must return to us. Stop what you're doing. So, in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall and in the open places where they'd be seen, I stationed people by their clans with their swords, spears, and bows. I looked in a row, I said to the nobles and officials and the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who's great and awesome. You fight for your brothers. You fight for your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. You don't be afraid. God is your father. God is going to protect you. He's great. He's awesome. You remember the Lord and fight. Action. When the enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we went back to the wall to work. But they did it half on, half off. Half of the workers building, the other half guarding. So that's done. Now, we go back to the story. So when uh, uh, there's no success at jeering and mockery, there's no success in provoking a fight, the attempted fight itself doesn't work. The wall actually gets built up after the, this has gone on. Where do we go from here? A commercial break. Chapter 5. Now, if you've been in this class before, you've probably been here on a week where we've talked about the Hebrew habit in writing of burying things in the middle of stories as opposed to at the top and the bottom. We've talked about chiasm. Well, this is an insert in the middle of the story. Now, it may have actually happened then, but there are some indications internally that it may have happened at a different time. But it's inserted here. And it is a chapter that basically tells a story about all of the rich Jews oppressing the poorer Jews who didn't have money to pay their taxes and didn't have food because of a famine. So the poorer Jews would borrow money from the richer Jews and the richer Jews would charge them exorbitant interest rates. Think 50-60%. And Nehemiah finds out about it and says, no, 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 and brings them all together. And then when he brings in all the richer Jews, he says to them, you can't do this. I mean, this is just wrong. What, what it had come to was when the, the poorer people couldn't pay it back, the richer people were saying, fine, I'll take your children as slaves. And Nehemiah says, that's just not going to do. And the rich people said, okay, 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 we'll, we'll reduce the interest rate. He says, no, that's not going to do. Okay, 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 we'll, we'll uh, give back some of the money we've already gotten and we'll take off all the interest. Nehemiah says, I want you to swear to that. With all due respect, I don't trust you. <laughs> so, commercial's done. Now, back to the story. So you've got the fighting, the provocation, the jeering, it didn't work, the wall goes up, the wall is built. They've still got to put the gates in, but it's basically done. Not to leave it alone, Sanballat and Tobiah, the others, they now try deception. First thing they do is they say, hey, come to the plain of Ono. Now that you've done this, hey, let's let bygones be bygones. Come on out. Here's a neutral place. I, I, I didn't bring a map of it, but if this is Judah, uh, there, that's the Dead Sea. That's the Sea of Galilee. You've got Jerusalem right here. So this is Judah. Oh, sorry. It was really pretty. You missed a lot. Okay. <clears throat> this is Judah. This is Samaria. Here's the plain of Ono. So he says, come on out to the plain of Ono, neutral place, and let's meet. Nehemiah says, yeah, like I'm a fool. And just sends him a note back. He says, there's so much stuff to do. I don't have time to go party with you. Then a second note gets sent. Oh, come on. And Nehemiah sends back his RSVP, no. And then a third note, and a no. And then a fourth note, and a no. 
And then Sanballat himself sends a handwritten note that says, okay, I know what you're doing. I know what you're about. I'm reporting you to the king. You're all going to get killed for treason. Your world is over if you don't come meet with me. And I really like this. It's in chapter 6. Chapter 6, we start with verse 1. Uh, let's see here. There we go. Sanballat and Tobiah and the rest, they heard that we'd built the wall, that there was no breach left in it, although you still hadn't set the doors in the gates. So they sent to me saying, hey, come meet with us in the plain of Ono, intending to do me harm. So I RSVP'd saying, oh, I'm real busy. I don't have time to come down. I shouldn't stop doing this just to come be with you. So they sent me four times in this way. I answered them the same way. So Sanballat the fifth time sends his servant with an open letter in his hand. And in the letter it's written, it's reported among the nations. And Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel and that's why you're rebuilding the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king and you've set up prophets to proclaim this concerning you in Jerusalem, that there's a king in Judah and the king's going to hear about all of this, so you better come and talk to us or you're in bad trouble. Nehemiah sends back and says, you're a dreamer. Now, it's not translated quite that way unless... You're reading my version. Instead, it's translated like this. No such things as you say have been done. You are inventing them out of your own mind. In other words, dream on. I know better. I'm the cup servant. The king trusted me with his life for years. He sent me here to do this. Dream on. Oh, God, strengthen my hands. Now, having said that, then there's another attempt at deception, which we'll just let you look at on your own. The second attempt at deception doesn't work any better than the first attempt at deception. And the walls go up, and the gates go in, and the work is completed. And in the first half of Nehemiah, you've got this section where the people of Israel are now, the people of Judah, the Jews, are now set apart physically. There is a wall between them and the pagans. But this story is not just about Jews having a physical wall between them and the pagans. This story goes further because there's also the issue of needing to be set apart spiritually. It doesn't matter if physically you're inside a church building. The question is where's your heart? It doesn't matter if you join a church. The question is, where's your heart? And so the people need to see what made a Jew a Jew was not simply being in Jerusalem behind a wall. Heavens, there were Jews outside of Jerusalem, outside of Judah. What made a Jew a Jew, first and foremost, was that they were following the law. These were to be people of the law. This was a chosen race that God had blessed with his very oracles, Paul says in Romans. His very words. And so, whoops, not too fast, Mark. So the people get set apart spiritually. How do they do that? They have day after day after day of the law being read. In fact, Ezra is called out to read the law. Now, there's a real fun interplay that goes on here if you're reading this stuff in Hebrew. In Hebrew, in the original, Ezra and Nehemiah are one book. They're not separated out. We've separated them out. But as originally put together, they were one scroll. And so you really have three principal earthly characters, not counting God, in this one scroll. You have Ezra, you have Nehemiah, and you have the people of God. Set the people aside for a moment. There's a real contrast between Ezra and Nehemiah. Nehemiah is this charge, take force, go for it kind of guy. When Nehemiah hears that the people are intermarrying, Nehemiah pulls their hair out. Ezra is the humble, quiet, servant, leader guy. When Ezra hears the people have intermarried, he pulls his own hair out. 
And you can see those distinctions throughout. Nehemiah has the law read. Ezra gets called by the people to read the law. Nehemiah is doing the building. Ezra steps up to read the law on a platform the people built for that purpose. Nehemiah's uh, fire and brimstone, Ezra's uh, quiet servant leadership. Both characteristics and traits that are helpful in God's kingdom, I might add, and both present there. So, They've been set apart spiritually. Now, uh, Ezra gets up. He reads the law. They've got people explaining the law. And they do this. They, they, they realize as they're reading the law, oh my, tomorrow we're supposed to start Sukkot, the festival of booths. Well, we haven't done that since Joshua. That's a, that's a big festival celebration. So they do that. But they're reading the law. At first, as they're reading the law, the people are weeping. Oh my, we have messed up so badly. And in their weeping and repentance, Nehemiah comes to him and says, okay, fine. But there's a joy of the Lord that should be your strength. And you have, you have messed up profusely, but you have recognized that. And God is a God of mercy, and he has extended his mercy to you. So now stop bellying, uh, wailing like a belly aching baby. That's what he basically says. And take joy and show what God has done for you by the way you behave. Now, that doesn't mean there's not a time for grief over sin. There is. But you don't stay there. You move on. Otherwise, you aren't showing God's forgiveness and love. All right, there are some themes that are unfolded here that I want to look at briefly. I've gone into a little bit more detail in your lesson. These are themes that are, are if you're reading through the book, you're going to see these themes. One big theme, of course, is God. And you find so many wonderful descriptions of God. God is uh, the God of heaven. God is great and awesome. God is called worthy of worship. God is the creator. And, and in fact, part of, of the storyline, Nehemiah chapter 9 tells the story from creation to that time. It walks through the books of Moses in a prayerful form. You can tell that the people were paying attention when the law was being read. The law being Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the books of Moses, the Pentateuch, the Torah. So he's creator, he's preserver, he's the great God, he's everlasting to everlasting. He's the God of steadfast love. He's the God who keeps covenant. He is the God who chose the nation of Israel. So there's a huge theme of who God is and how God moves. And it's especially touching because he's, quote, my God to Nehemiah. That'll be a point for home in a minute. There's a second group that's really important in this. People quickly will say God is a theme. They'll quickly say Nehemiah is a theme or a major character or Ezra is a major character. But I believe another major character, and perhaps the major character in this story, are the people themselves. The people themselves. If you look, there's some bizarre stuff in here that you just wonder, well, what does that do me at Champion Forest Baptist Church in 2012? For example, chapter 3. They're rebuilding the wall here in chapter 3. And here's what you see. Eliashib, the high priest, rises up with his brothers. They built the sheep gate. Let's see. Uh, next to him, the men of Jericho built. Next to them, Zakur, son of Emri. And then the sons of Hasenaah built the fish gate and laid it on its beams. And then there was Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakos, And then Meshulam and Meshizabel. You know, this is not just a practice in reading Hebrew names. This is not a book so that you can figure out, hey, I think I'm going to name my son Meshulam. I'm going to name my son Bezadia. And you see it throughout chapter 3. I mean, let's skip down. We'll skip to verse 24. Verse 24. 
After him, Benui, the son of Hinnadad, repaired another section from the house of Azariah to the buttress. And you've got all these people, name after name after name in chapter 3, all detailed. Then you get to chapter 7. Chapter 7, list of returned exiles. Do you think we're going to see some names here? Oh, yeah. Look at this. Uh, Zerubbabel, Yeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Ramah, ba 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 all the way down. It just keeps going. You think that's it? Nah. Ten, when they seal the covenant. On the seals are the names of Nehemiah and all of his relatives and everybody else and everybody else and everybody else. Name after name after name. And even when they're not being named, you have passages like Nehemiah chapter 8 where Ezra reads the law. And you have this throughout the book. You'll see this. And all the people gathered as one man. And the people told Ezra to bring the law out and read it. So Ezra brings it out and all who could understand what they heard reacted. Or, or he read to he read from it facing the square, um, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book. Ezra stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. Beside him stood lots of people who helped, and Ezra read above all the people, and he opened it, all the people stood, and all all the people answered, lifting up their hands with bowed heads, and they worshiped the Lord. And then we see names more, so that the people understood the reading. And, and this is found throughout the book. Because one of the emphasis of this book are the people of God. God didn't just want a wall built. Because there were some boulders lying around untidily and it needed to be cleaned up. That's not what this was about. This is about the people of God. This is the last narrative we have in Scripture about the people of God until Matthew chapter 1. Now, we've still got 400 years to go. We've got two minor prophets we haven't talked about in this class. But this is it. This is the narrative. The narrative ends here. We've got some books in the middle, some apocryphal books, that tell us a little bit about what happened between this point in time and the next. But in terms of your Old Testament Hebrew scriptures, they end here. Time-wise, for narrative. What God had done is he had set it up and he had set the seed up for his gospel story. And the promise had always been that through the seed of Abraham would come one through whom all the nations would be blessed. And so the narrative ends with the Jews spread out throughout the world, dispersed the diaspora, but still a holy set-apart group that were now people of the law. They were set apart, but they were reading the law, loving the law, understanding the law, trying to live by the law. And all of those are the elements that have to not just be in place, but need a while to percolate before the time is ripe for the Messiah to come. All the pieces are there. All of the crops have been sown. It just needs time to grow. See, all those dispersed Jews need time to grow communities where they are and build synagogues for worship where they're still teaching the law so that Paul is able to go throughout the Mediterranean world with a ready audience of people who know the law who know the scriptures and understand how the Messiah, Jesus Christ, answers them. The stage is set. I talked a little bit about that. Let's go to the points for home. 
Nehemiah 2.1.8. I told them the hand of my God that had been upon me for good was behind this building project. And all the people said, hey, then we're in. But I love the fact that with all of those phrases about God and all of those descriptions, Nehemiah says, my God. Because I want to say something here. I want to say it real plainly. If you watch this on the internet, I want you to hear from my heart this is true. I know for a fact this is true. God is not God because I worship him. God is not God because I think about him. God is not God because I figured out who he is. God is whether Mark Lanier gives one wit or not. Whether I know him, whether I acknowledge him, whether I even believe he exists, he's still God and he's still in charge. I just have a chance for him to be my God. What an honor. What an honor. I have a chance to be on his team. I can, the, the, the God of all will be mine. May my God be, may God be my God. Number two. We built the wall for the people had a mind to work. Something happens in your life. You've got a problem. Can I make three suggestions? If you got a problem, pray about it and then do something about it. It's not simply, look, God didn't call you just to pray and not do. And he didn't call you just to do and not pray. You see a problem? Pray about it and do what God leads you to do. Say, well, I'm not sure he's leading me. Well, then you just keep praying about it, but you do what seems right to you. Because one of the ways he leads us, and this is one reason we read scripture, and this is one reason we go to church, this is one reason we fellowship with other people, this is one reason we worship the Lord. We have the assurance from Paul in Romans that God is at work renewing our minds. He's transforming our minds. He's changing the way we think. Sometimes God's going to lead you through what you're thinking. It's not just you have a ring in your nose that he puts a holy finger in and pulls you around. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes he may have to do that with some of us. I'm not putting him in a box and saying he doesn't do any of that stuff. I'm just saying sometimes you pray about it and then you do what seems right and best to you in accordance with Scripture. Last point. The king said, what are you requesting? What do you want? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, I love that good and ready relationship where your prayer is in your heart and in your mind. I mean, the psalmist said that he knows our thoughts before even a word's on our tongue. He knows what it is. Paul talks about how the Spirit intercedes for us in prayer with groanings too deep for words. What it means is a relationship where whatever is going on, this is what Paul means with pray without, when he said pray without ceasing. Whatever's going on, you are so tuned into God that there's this dialogue that's just going on. It's 12.02. I'm supposed to be done two minutes ago. I'm not done. Now, I can, well, I can say that, I can say that, or I can say, God, what am I supposed to do? You see, this is the way it works, at least uh, I think. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for this two and a half years we've spent in your word in the Old Testament. And as we contemplate looking still at Malachi and Zechariah, I pray you'll bless it as we bring this Old Testament study to a close. Lord, I pray your blessings on each person here. I pray that you'll move in their hearts to convict them to draw closer to you. To grow in their relationship. May we all grow in our relationship, Lord. All of us. To where you are the ready thought on our mind to where prayer and action are a tandem we walk into immediately in our life in all ways. 
Bless my friends, please, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.